first uh, to say a few words to welcome everybody here. I see uh, familiar faces and also uh, new faces. So thank you for coming. I think we invited uh, quite a number of organizations. Um, there's someone from Kementerian uh, Wanita. Um, there is, well, Dr. Simler from the World Bank who's been coming, you know, uh, supporting us in our activities. Um, Dr. Sulo. I see former directors. Okay, to welcome also former directors, Dr. Sulo, Dr. Iqmal is here. Uh, our avid supporter. Yes, Dr. Fatima, of course, she's going to chair. <laughs> she's the moderator. <laughs> she's too close to me, I couldn't see her. Okay, so just uh, briefly, uh, what we have been doing, this is a second uh, round table. Uh, I think the first one is about going beyond. This time, I think what we try to do is going forward and going forward. And we are very pleased to go forward today with uh, having Professor Martin Ravayon as our chairholder. Um, and also going forward, this time we have a visiting professor, uh, Dr. Dominic Van der Waal. Uh, the topic today, uh, I think, is very interesting. Uh, again, when we, when we met in 2017, uh, it's about going beyond poverty. I think the consensus was that we're not going beyond poverty yet. So there are pockets of poverty, there are other issues relating to poverty. So this time, the topic is on revis revisiting poverty measurement globally and for Malaysia. So let's hope that we can see better uh, with what is going to be presented to us today. Uh, there's always issues, data and challenges uh, doing this work. So I hope we will get a lot of uh, key takeaways uh, to think about. So to chair the session, I would like to invite uh, Professor Fatima Kari. Uh, we have, I think, allocated about uh, two hours, uh, plus minus, for Professor Martin to speak. And then we open for Q&A, and after that, we have lunch. So thank you for coming, and I hope we will have a learning experience as well here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Samsul. Assalamualaikum. Salam sejahtera. Selamat pagi. Very good morning. Um, personally, I would like to welcome everybody to today's uh, roundtable. I'm glad to see all the familiar faces, the new faces and whatever faces out there. Um, I believe those who are here today uh, feel so compassionate about or feel, feel so strongly about the issue of poverty and some of us have done work in the area and some of us are doing work in that area. Uh, a good feeling is when everybody get together just to look at the issue again and then revisit some of the things like what uh, Dr. Samson had said. My job today is very simple, just to make sure that we keep within the time because the schedule is rather tight. We only have the first half of the morning to sort of uh, go on with the, uh, uh, with the round table. Um, personally, I'm, I feel that I'm extremely fortunate to have uh, Martin with us and of course Dominic. I think the last three weeks has been quite, um, I should say, uh, interesting time to listen to new ideas and whatnot. Yeah? Um, I just tell myself I have a lot more to learn uh, from, from this type of uh, discussion. And of course, as you may uh, know, uh, Prof, uh, Prof. Martin Rabelon is the second chairholder for Unku Aziz. Um, Unku Aziz Chair, Unku, Royal Professor Unku Aziz uh, on Poverty and Development. Um, I believe, again, all of us today have done work on poverty directly and indirectly. And the question of poverty, as what Dr. Samsul had mentioned, have changed in terms of definition, have changed in terms of context, and changed in terms of measurement, and all through. I think for 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 us, 
a lot of uh, researcher here in Malaysia. At one time, we never know about urban poverty. I think in the early part of independent days, there is no such thing as urban poverty here in Malaysia. But of late, it is high on the policy agenda. So we have to really look at it again and look at new measurement and concept. Um, I'm also glad that uh, uh, Martin is here with us to share a lot of his work and insight. And I have a small confession to make. When I was in a graduate school in the US, my professor forced me or uh, the class to take and read of all your work. Um, going through the technical part and the mathematical part, I, if I may recall, is a real challenge. But I'm very fortunate because the, the, uh, Lynn, Lynn Anderson, my professor, doesn't ask us to sit for the exam as far as that material is concerned. I don't think I would have made it if it's just a sitting exam. He just asked us to take it home and debate it. So I'm safe by that. So uh, indeed, I will never dream of the fact that I'll meet you in person today, right? After going through all the works that during the graduate school. Anyway, that was years, uh, those years. Now, I will not take any more of that time, uh, Martin. I will sort of... Uh, let you discuss about the topic given to you. And uh, without further ado, the floor is all yours. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, really, thank you, Fatima, but, but thank you, uh, Shamsul, and your team for being such great hosts, uh, for in inviting me to give this talk, but being such great hosts for this period uh, at the University of Malaya. Um, my topic today is, is, is huge. <laughs> Um, I can't possibly do complete justice to it, but I am going to kind of flag some issues that I think get too little attention and that seem very relevant to Mal Malaysia today. Poverty measurement is really the... Oh, let's start turning this on. Okay, uh, poverty measurement is really the start of a discussion about poverty. It, it's not the end, it's the beginning. Um, but poverty measures have, have for a long time, it's working now. Think so? No, it's not working. It works if I, yes it's on, it's on. Um, Poverty measurement is the start of a discussion about poverty, but it, it's only the start. Um, this lecture will be mainly about measurement. The public lecture is going to be about both inequality and policies. So I know many of you will be impatient to talk about policies, and I'm happy to do that. That's most, or well, at least half of what I do. Uh, but um, today it's, it's measurement focused. And that is really, as I say, the foundation for discussing poverty. Um, there are many views we hear, I've just listed some of them uh, here. The, the rich countries have less poverty, economic growth reduces poverty, population urbanization reduces poverty, poverty is falling in the developing world, inequality is falling in Malaysia, Malaysia has nearly eradicated poverty. I've heard, you've heard, every single one of these claims. But are they right? Are they robust to the assumptions we're making about measurement? We have to look very carefully at those assumptions. The public at large look at poverty statistics, proportion of people living below some poverty line. They don't know what goes into those numbers. And they don't understand the conceptual foundations. Um, and those foundations are often a little bit shaky. In fact, I'm going to say they're a lot shaky. What is the, the narrative today? say, the prevailing narrative on poverty. Well, the method is, is essentially this. We set a real poverty line that's fixed in real terms over space and over time, and we look at how many people live below that line. Um, this is just not, I think the battery's dead, I think. So, um, okay. Um, this is uh, the picture for Malaysia. I'm sorry. I think the battery's gone. 
Um, this is the picture from Malaysia. Uh, this is Malaysia, uh, Malaysia's success, and, and it's you know, part of the reason we're here is to try and understand that success and, and, and assess it and try to inform discussion. But uh, we've seen the, the poverty rate in Malaysia falling, the official poverty rate falling from 49% around 1970 to 0.04% today. Many issues underlying the data, and I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'm just, uh, in fact, I, all of these issues have been uh, looked at in the literature. The quality of the data, issues of selective compliance with surveys. Uh, I think that's a big problem here. In other words, a lot of well-off, rich people don't participate in household surveys. Uh, there are biases in the measurement associated with that. Um, that's more an issue for inequality measurement, so I'm going to talk a bit more about that in the public lecture. Uh, the setting of the poverty line. Is it set at an appropriate level? The, if we set the co poverty line in fixed terms, in real terms over time, you've got to ask yourself, is the poverty line that we set for Malaysia in 1970 still appropriate today? Does it reflect people's understanding of what the word poverty means today in Malaysia? I'm going to argue it probably doesn't. Issues of consumption or, po or, or income, uh, equivalent scales, how do we normalize consumption or income, and other dimensions of welfare. We could talk a lot about all of these things. I'm going to focus on just a couple of issues that aren't in this list, but are major concerns. The first I've already hinted at is the existence of social effects on welfare. Fifteen years ago, I wouldn't have said this. We've learned from research in social science and psychology and now in economics. We've learned that people don't just think of their welfare as determined solely by their own income or consumption. They make relative comparisons. They ask, how, how, are, how, are, they, how are you doing relative to some comparison group? This has been pretty well established. In, across a number of countries. There's more research going on about it. Uh, there's a little bit of research in Malaysia, not much, but, but some. Um, a lot of questions come up. I, if you recognize that people care about their relative position in society, you've got to ask, are those absolute poverty measures appropriate? Those absolute measures assume people only care about their own income. Well, it's clear they don't. So there's something wrong here. The measure may not reflect the way people think about their own welfare. So we may say somebody's not poor, but they won't agree with you. I'm also going to touch on something I think could be very interesting to develop in the future, the idea of a social subjective poverty line for, for Malaysia. Uh, a second issue, um, quite a bit of research on social effects on welfare, almost nothing on this t issue, which I'm going to talk about. The idea that when we talk about levels of living in society, are we talking about just people at the poverty line? Often we ask questions like, have we left, thank you, are people left behind? Are the poorest being reached? If you look at the sustainable development goals of the UN, the first of which is to um, eliminate absolute poverty by 2030, and I, I wrote that goal, um, if you look at the sustainable development goals, throughout that report you will see endless statements about leave no one behind. That idea of eliminating poverty in the world by 2030, which I don't think we're going to achieve, but the idea is that it's eliminate poverty. It's reach the poorest. It's not just reduce the poverty rate, it's reach the poorest. You're not going to eliminate poverty unless the poorest person rises to the poverty line. That's a question about the level of living at the bottom of society. But we're not monitoring that. Nowhere is anybody measuring the level of living of the poorest people. We measure a poverty. Me we do poverty measures, and we have fancy poverty measures, and simple poverty measures, a range of measures, but we're not focusing on the very lowest level of living. What I'm going to call the floor, but that's actually not an easy thing to measure. 
Household surveys are not designed for that purpose. So I'm going to have to come up with a, a way of measuring the lowest level of living. It's a difficult statistic. Okay, social effects on welfare. Um, Ungu Aziz is famous for the Sarong Index. But you may not realize the Sarong Index is an absolute poverty measure. Aziz said that one way of measuring poverty is count the number of Sarongs in a family divided by the number of people above the age of one. That's how he wrote it in his inaugural address at the University of Malaya in 1963. The Sarong Index is an absolute measure, just like the, I described before. The way poverty is measured in most of the developing world is to set an absolute line and fix it in real terms. Well, that's an example, a very simple example. Now, when Aziz uh, developed the Sarong Index, he didn't have the kinds of household surveys we have today. We can measure many things besides how many Sarongs the household has. We can measure all of their consumption, pretty much. Okay. Uh, but there's another point, even before, uh, in Aziz's inaugural lecture, even before he mentions the Sarong Index, he talks about poverty as a relative concept. And he had, does this thought experiment. The thought experiment is simple. He says, imagine Imagine a society, um, people on an island, um, adequate food and shelter, and no inequality. Uh, he argues they would have no concept of poverty. It would be a meaningless term. They're adequately fed and clothed, there's no inequality. And then he says, imagine if someone from this island visited Singapore or Sydney. I love the fact that he said Sydney, my hometown. Singapore or Sydney. And they saw the way very rich people live. And they went back to the island. Then they would know what poverty was. You can reverse it. Imagine somebody from Sydney or Singapore who goes to this island. They will think people are really poor. They will understand what poverty is too. There's an inherent relativism. And you can't escape that. Okay, what's the evidence? People care about relative consumption. Well, uh, you know, I, I can't talk about Ungu Aziz without mentioning somebody else equally prominent in my childhood, or actually more so, I must say, um, Janis Joplin. You might not have heard of Janis Joplin. Janis Joplin was, I think, the greatest female rock singer in history. But Janis Joplin had a song, which I remember, I know every word of this song. Um, oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all drive Porsches. I must make amends. <laughs> Actually, she's, she's sending it up. She's sending up rich people, right? But she's talk, sending them up by talking about their relativism and so on. I mean, she's talking from the perspective of a poor person, uh, but talking about the aspirations of others. Sorry. Um, tons of other research, scientific research from a host of people on, on lab laboratory experiments, uh, econometric analysis using subjective welfare data, um, a host of sources, which have all, pretty much all, have pointed to the idea that people care about relative position. For example, if we look at subjective welfare and we ask how you rate your subjective welfare relative to others, uh, we can see, also ask, how does your subjective welfare vary with, your, with the welfare of the friends and neighbours you have? If they get better off, do you feel worse off, given your own income? Within countries, the answer is, is yes. Within neighbourhoods, too. It's often quite localised. So the questions today, do current me measures of global uh, poverty uh, make economic sense? Now, economic sense, for, for an economist like me, the way I'm going to translate what I just talked about into economic set to make economic sense of it is I'm going to ask whether the, the poverty measures are what I'm going to call welfare consistent. What does that mean? 
if I judge two people to have the same level of welfare, then I treat them the same way in my measure. I don't say if I think one person's better off than another, you know, then they both can't be equally poor or equally rich. There's a difference. I have to respect that difference. My concept of welfare ranks people. That's a normative concept. It ranks people, but we have to do it consistently. If I think person A is better off than person B, then my poverty measure can't ignore that. I can't be saying that they're equally well off or, or, or that I reverse. The person I think is, is better off is actually poorer. That would make no sense. Welfare consistency is a conceptually very demanding, straight, simple criterion uh, due to a, a, an Italian economist, Pareto. I'm going to apply this idea to poverty measurement. Are appropriate. So some theoretical arguments for two kinds of poverty lines in the world. Absolute and relative. I've mentioned what absolute are. The relative lines that exist and the absolute lines are common throughout the developing world and in one rich country, the United States. The United States uses an absolute poverty line. It's the only rich country that does. Uh, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> um, it's not actually because Americans don't care about relative income <laughs> or relative position. Uh, and in fact, a lot of that research is for America. It's an historical accident. The US, to my knowledge, is the only country in the world where the poverty line is set by the administration, is set by the president's office, essentially. And once you do that, in a country like any country, it becomes impossible to change. All you can do is update for the uh, inflation. If the, if, w instead, the poverty line is normally set by the statistics office. So they can revise it, they can think, is it appropriate to current levels of living in the society and so on. So it's a bit of an historical accident. The reason it ha that happened in the United States is, is the Johnson administration war on poverty in the 1960s. They needed a poverty measure and Johnson was leading the way in the anti-poverty effort. So he asked uh, the Social Security Administration to come up with a poverty line and that was by a, a female, a woman economist, Molly Oshansky, and it's very famous. Molly Oshansky wrote that poverty line in 1960s, 1963, but it hasn't been updated ever since. Also, if we go back 100 years in the United States, the poverty line that was used in around the early 20th century was about the level of the poverty lines used in low-income countries today. It was about a uh, dollar, two dollars a day depending on the, on, on the um, base for your index. So the poverty line today in the United States is $16 a day. So over 100 years, it's risen enormously with the rise in, in levels of living in the United States. It's just got stuck at this $16 level in, in 2015 prices ever since. However, in, in a large part of the rich world, they use relative poverty measures. I'm going to be critical of these measures. I'm going to be just as critical of these measures. These measures, to me, make no economic sense either. If people care about relative position, this type of measure does not make sense, as I've explained. If people only care about relative position, then strongly relative measures may make sense, but they don't. People care about their own income, and they care about their relative position. You can't convince me that it's one thing to say that people make relative comparisons. You think about how are you doing relative to your peers, relative to the, the kids you grew up with, relative to your neighbours, relative to the citizens in your country. It's one thing to say they do that. Another thing to say that that's all they care about. That doesn't make sense either. People also care about their absolute level of living. They care about both their absolute level of living and they care about their relative position. They want their both to rise. They want their absolute level of rise to rise. But if their absolute level rises but their relative position falls, they may not feel much better off. But both things are in play. Strongly relative lines, as I'm going to show you, violate that condition. A strongly relative line takes the form of a poverty line that's a constant proportion of the mean. Some number k, typically around 0.5, times the mean or median. 
I'm going to call these strongly relative lines. And the key property of the line, analytically, the key property of those lines that I'm going to use is the fact that the elasticity of the poverty line to the mean is automatically 1. In other words, if the mean rises by 10%, the poverty line rises by 10%. Now you can see immediately what the implication will be. If all incomes grow at a, a given rate, poverty won't change. All incomes grow at a given rate. All incomes, including those of the poor, grow at a rate, maybe it's a very respectable rate, the 5 10% per annum. They all grow. The poverty line will rise to the same proportion. Poverty measure won't change. That's very disturbing property. So what do welfare consistent measures look like? In fact, before I wrote the paper this is based on in the Review of Economic Statistics 2011, um, we didn't know the answer to this question. We didn't know what a welfare consistent poverty measure would look like. And in that paper, uh, I derived the measure. Um, and I'm going to use that today. Okay, um, the starting point though, the theoretical starting point, like everything in poverty measurement, it always comes back to one person, Amartya Sen. Um, and that's going to be my starting point. Sen said, the overriding principle, poverty line is absolute in the space of welfare. An absolute approach in the space of capabilities translates into a relative approach in the space of commodities. In Sen's thinking, and I agree fully with this, poverty is only absolute in the welfare space. That's why my welfare consistency criterion is so important. It is cons poverty is about your level of well-being. Income is something you use to generate well-being. Other things too, access to public services, you know, very important. It's about your welfare, not your income per se. Sen thought about that, thinks about that in terms of capabilities. I'm going to be a bit more conservative. I'm just going to think about it in terms of what economists call welfare. But you can define welfare as capabilities. I have no problem with that. Okay, a little bit of economics. I've kept this very simple. I'll flash forward a little bit, given the mouse. So think, here's, a, here's this equation that says, basically, what I'm saying now, I think the laser pointer will work. Yeah. Okay. Um, utility, welfare is a function of your own income and your income relative to the mean. Now you can make this more complicated. I can think about the reference group. The reference group may be a different people, d different to the country of residence. That's a, that's obviously a big reference group. You may think of your reference group as as your friends and neighbours, the people you grew up, maybe the kids you were in school with, uh, and so on. But for now, so because I'm going to be doing this at the country level, it's natural to think of the reference group as the people in the country you live in. The important thing about this is it depends on your own income, Y, and your income relative to the mean, Y over M. That could be a, a capability function, it could be a, what economists call a utility function. There are many possible interpretations. Well, okay, if that's, if that's how I think about welfare, what is a poverty line? A poverty line is the money you need to achieve a reference level of welfare. Remember, we're going to think of poverty as absolute in the space of welfare. You're poor if your level of well-being is below some critical level. So we're going to have to back out a poverty line which reflects, is a money metric of that level of welfare. The way we do that, here we fix the level of welfare. This is the level of well-being, wh whatever it is, your capabilities, your utility, your subjective welfare. The, the, the level of well-being, we say we judge people to be poor if they don't achieve that level of well-being. And we back out the money you need to achieve it. How do we do that? Well, we place the Y here by the Z, the poverty line, 
where we back out the Pave line as a function of the mean and the reference level of utility. An immediate implication of that is that the elasticity of the Pave line to the mean cannot exceed 1, and in fact it must be below 1. It can never be 1. It must be positive, but it must be less than 1. And that follows automatically from the assumption that you, your welfare depends on both your own income and your relative income. And I just proved that point there. Keep trying. Um, so the, immediate impl the implication of this <laughs> is that neither the absolute approach or the strongly relative approach can be right. The absolute approach sets the elasticity at zero. The relative approach, the Eurostat, European OECD, all of that, sets it at one. The two extremes, they're both wrong. Under this simple assumption about how people think about their welfare, you care about your own income and you care about your relative income, they're both wrong. Neither of them make economic sense. We need another measure. This is wrong. By the way, just this shows you, if you think about, if you use a strongly relative measure, like 50% of the mean, what are you assuming about welfare? It's probably intuitively obvious. You're assuming that people only care about their relative income. You would see that by saying, fix the reference level of utility, back out the poverty line, it's going to be constant proportion of the mean, and this constant is the inverse of the utility function evaluated at that point. Simple. So we can, I, I can rationalize the strongly relative poverty lines, but only if I assume people don't care about their own income given their relative income. You cannot convince me that's true. Nowhere in the world do I think people only care about relative income. None of the research says that. Well, almost none. There's one paper, but it's questionable uh, for other reasons, but I won't go into it. By the way, it was published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, but that doesn't prove anything. Um, okay, I've talked about the kind of utility interpretation. One reaction I get to this is from, often from non-economists, what is this thing utility? What is this U function? They want to do it in terms of capabilities, and Sen has actually been more influential, I think, here amongst non-economists in social sciences than economists. Economists have been stuck to the utility concept, and like me. Um, but I want to translate all of this into a capabilities concept, into a capabilities way of thinking. And one way of doing that is to think of, this is following Tony Atkinson, um, who passed away two years ago, um, was my, also my PhD supervisor, and I just learned an enormous amount of from, and, from uh, and Francois Bouguignon, the Paris School of Economics. Um, they, they think of, uh, they interpret the Sen approach, and I think this is quite nice, in terms of two basic capabilities, the capability of survival and the capability of social inclusion. And they say that you're, you're in, their concept, in their concept, you're not poor if you're neither absolutely poor, you've reached your survival capabilities, nor relatively poor, your social inclusion capabilities. That's very nice. But that does not imply, and here I, I part company with Atkinson and Bourguignon, that does not imply strongly relative poverty measures. Why? Well, you think about social inclusion. The famous example of social inclusion is in The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Great book. Some of the reviews have been terrible, but it's a terrific book. Adam Smith, The Review of uh, the, the Loss of Nations, and also his earlier book, Moral Sentiments, fantastic stuff. Um, by the way, and Adam Smith would be really, would turn in his grave if he saw modern American capitalism. The, Adam Smith, who's given the credit for inventing the idea of capitalism, would not approve. Okay. Um, <laughs> 
a credible day, Smith wrote, a credible day labourer would be ashamed to appear in public without a linen shirt, the want of which would be supposed to denote that disgraceful degree of poverty which it is assumed nobody, uh, nobody can well fall into without extreme bad conduct. I've almost never said that last bit, well fall into without extreme bad conduct, without, without tripping. It's uh, 18th century English, so it's very hard to say that. Anyway, I tripped again. Um, People point to that and say, oh, look, Adam Smith, linen shirt, relativism. But think about it. If I set the poverty line as a constant proportion of the mean, that's saying that the cost of that Adam Smith's linen shirt can go to zero as the mean goes to zero. Nonsense. The cost of that linen shirt, that socially acceptable linen shirt in 18th century England, that cost is the same whether you're rich or poor, it's the same whether you're living in a rich country or poor country, roughly. Yeah, it may be a little different, but we can assume it's pretty similar. The poverty line will not go to zero as the mean goes to zero. So this way of thinking, social inclusion needs, cannot imply Z equals K times M, the, re the strongly relative poverty lines. It just not, it doesn't follow. There are other examples. Cat in Yemen is one of my favourite. You, know, you know what cat is? Uh, this, this fresh leaf that uh, people in Yemen and Djibouti and uh, uh, chew for a long hour, three hours a day. You chew. You see, first time I saw it, this looked like a tumour in this guy's mouth. But people are chewing cat for hours on end. Um, very hard to understand cat, except as a social inclusion need. If you can't get into a cat session in in in, in Yemen. Now, I don't know what, I'm sure what's happened in Yemen is rather to upset the cat market. Um, I don't know if they can get fresh cat anymore, but so maybe this is, some people would say that might be a good implication of what's happened in Yemen, but I don't think anything could excuse what's happened in Yemen. But anyway, um, if you can't get into a cat session, you are socially excluded in Yemen society. Of course, you know, there are male cat sessions and female cat sessions, and never the two shall mix. But you, know, you, you have to, a cat session is where business is done. It's a social economic interchange. It involves rich people, poor people mixing together. It's a hugely important social part of, of Yemeni society. Uh, poor people in, in, in Yemen, I made this ca calculation in Sana'a once, that the 10% the of their income was going to cat. The poorest 10%, 10% of income going to cat. That's a lot. You know? Uh, a third or fourth of, of, of what they spent on food. It's definitely a social inclusion need. And there are many other examples we can talk to, talk about. But the key point is that if you accept the, co the cost of cat is the same for a rich person as a poor person, social inclusion needs, their cost does not go to zero. Another way of saying this is we use strongly relative poverty lines, setting the poverty lines of say 50% of the mean, you're going to get very low poverty lines in poor countries. If you use 50% of the mean in the poorest countries in the world, you're talking about a poverty line that is known to be below survival level. Survival level is about uh, 70 cents a day, 2005 prices, $1 a day for about three weeks, anything less than that, you will drop dead. Uh, if you use 50% of the mean, you're going to be using a poverty line in, in places like Yemen, which is half of survival needs. It doesn't make sense. And the reason it doesn't make sense is that the needs of both survival and social inclusion, those costs, the costs do not fall to zero. They are bounded below. So the point of all this is the only way we can construct a sensible poverty measure is this. We've got to think of the poverty line as having a positive intercept. And see this line here? That's going to be what I'm going to call a weekly relative line. Weakly relative, not strongly relative. Why do I say weakly relative? Because the as long as this intercept is positive, the elasticity of the poverty line must be below one. You can do the math. By setting that intercept at a positive value, which is, that intercept is, for example, the, the cost of a socially acceptable Ad uh, Adam Smith's linen shirt in 18th century England, or the cost of cat, or whatever the social inclusion need is in the specific society, that intercept is the cost of social inclusion in the poorest place. 
The absolute line is fixed independently of the mean. The strongly relative, or the atkinson bugin line, is, is, is has homogeneous to degree zero. It goes through the intercept. That's what I'm saying doesn't make sense. It's got to have a positive intercept. Whether it's a straight line or not, no, I don't care. Maybe, maybe not. But the key thing is it's got to have that positive intercept. How can we implement this? The starting point in setting global poverty lines has been national poverty lines. This is an approach that um, we developed for the 1990 World Development Report um, with, uh, with uh, Gaurav Dat and, and Dominique van der Waal is here. Um, and that's the basis for the dollar a day poverty line. It's the average line of the poorest countries. Well, what's an analogous approach using uh, toward a weekly relative poverty measure? Well, we're going to look at national poverty lines. These are national poverty lines across countries plotted against mean consumption. Um, here's this point I made about the United States. The current U official poverty line in the US is about the level of we'd expect in a relatively high income developing country. In fact, it's a bit ab only a bit above the poverty line that I think I would expect to see in Malaysia. And the reason is it hasn't been adjusted over time for this, because of this historical accident. So you put that aside. What do we see? Higher poverty lines, poor, lower poverty lines in poorer countries. The dollar a day line is set around this. So one approach is to think, well, let's follow that, let's track national poverty lines. Let's set the weekly relative poverty line to do with that function. Um, we're going to have a problem here. And the problem is, we don't know why we see that relationship. There are two possible reasons, and they're very different. One is, what I've talked about already, the cost of social inclusion. I'm going to call that social effects. The second reason are, is social norms. Now, I haven't said anything about that, but I can't eliminate, I can't dismiss the possibility that the reason we see higher poverty lines in richer countries is not that you need more income to achieve the same level of welfare, but rather that richer countries use a higher reference level of welfare in deciding who's poor and who's not. That's a deep identification problem. We have two possible reasons. One, social effects on welfare, that you need a higher income to achieve the same level of welfare given social inclusion needs become more expensive as, econ as economies develop. Second, a social norm. That the norms we use, the reference level of welfare rises as the mean rises. If you go back to this, we can think about it this way. As I've said, the poverty line, the ideal poverty line is a function of the mean and the reference utility level. Here's, at a given reference the utility level, a higher mean will, will generally associate with high needs of social inclusion and so on. But this could also rise with the mean. And we don't know which it is. But that's a problem. Why? Well, I, if, I th if I think it's only social norms, why would I use a higher poverty line in richer countries? In talking about global welfare, for example, global poverty. That would not be fair. The fact that a richer country uses a higher reference level of welfare, well, that's fine. They can do that. I, nobody could say that's wrong. But if I want to compare people globally, I should use the same reference, the same reference level of welfare, because remember, I want to be welfare consistent. So if the reason the poverty line is rising is the social norms, the reference level of welfare is rising, then I have to discount that. Ethically, that would be unacceptable. That is a morally unacceptable position, in my view. But if it's due to social effects on welfare, I'm fine. Yes, I should be using a higher poverty line in richer countries, and I should be using a higher poverty line as a, as a country develops economically. The point of that is that we're going to have to think of lower and upper bounds to poverty measurement. Reflecting this deep uncertainty about why we see higher poverty lines in richer countries, why we see poverty lines rise over time as countries develop, why we see 
po higher poverty lines in richer countries. The lower bound is going to assume that the, the, the gradient only reflects differences in social norms. So an absolute poverty line now assumes, in this interpretation, that the social effect, the, 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 the um, changing poverty line as in incomes rise, only reflects social norms. The upper bound is going to assume that it reflects social effects on welfare. In other words, we're going to have to think of two poverty lines for every country and every date, an absolute line and a relative line. And the true welfare consistent measure is somewhere between the two, depending on how much people care about relative position, in its essence. OK, what's that going to look like? Back to that map of poverty lines. Now I'm going to blow it up just for, um, for developing countries. And here's what it looks like. Uh, the, you know, th this PowerPoint is, is going to be available to everybody uh, so you can study this picture. It, it took a lot, took me and my co-authors quite a lot to develop this picture, as, as you can imagine. But what about Malaysia? Oops. Here we have, excluding the OECD, all the countries where we find national poverty lines. Where is Malaysia today? About there. If given Malaysia's average income, I would expect to see a poverty line around $12 a day. What is Malaysia's poverty line today? $4 a day. No doubt at all that Malaysia has made a huge progress in getting, virtually eliminating that sort of poverty. But is that still what poverty means in Malaysia today? And that's my question. I would expect to see a poverty line far higher. In other words, another way of thinking about it, Malaysia's poverty line today is the poverty line we'd expect to see in countries much lower average income than Malaysia. Implementing all of this on data, um, I'm going to be using PovCalNet for the developing countries. I have to, I have to use PovCalNet for Malaysia as well. PovCalNet is the World Bank's interactive poverty site, which I designed long ago, but is, is, been, is, is a very useful tool. Um, it covers, it, it includes 1,500 household surveys for 150 countries. Um, I'm going to base everything on the 2011 ICP. Not that I fully agree with the 2011 ICP, but that's another issue. Uh, for Malaysia, I, I've got to use PovCalNet as well because I don't have access, unlike virtually every country in the world, I do not have access to the micro data for poverty measurement in Malaysia. It is not public data. I could try to get access through some back door or something, and a few people have done that. Uh, I'm not going to do that. I want it to be public access, like it is for virtually every country in the world. That lack of public access means that I'm going to have to use PovCalNet. Um, I will explain to you how PovCalNet gets around that problem, if you ask me, but it's, it's a, not crucial to the analysis. I, I believe pretty much all the calculations I'm doing here are would be pretty accurate, but they're limited in certain ways that I, I can explain to you. What do we see globally? Here's the lower and upper bound. These are global poverty measures going back to around 1990. Um, for both the absolute line, and here I've used $1.90 a day, and uh, the weekly relative line. So we're seeing progress against uh, poverty from both points of view, from both lines. Um, and the lower line, which is the basis for the, uh, SD, the, the um, SDG 1, 1.1, uh, uh, we are on track for achieving the lower, uh, eliminating the, the $1.90 a day poverty rate by 2030. I don't think we're going to achieve it, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a, in a moment. 
Um, numbers are poor. Not doesn't look, look so good for the upper bound, but uh, still pretty good for the lower bound. Um, the breakdown of global poverty. Um, here's the global count for the upper bound. Uh, absolute poverty in the developing world. Relative poverty in the developing world. Rising, falling. So what we're seeing today is ri falling numbers of absolutely poor people in the developing world and, and most countries, not just a few countries, most countries now, um, but we're seeing rising relative poverty. Another interesting thing globally, I'll come to, I'll come to Malaysia in a moment, another interesting thing globally, um, sometime around, just around the global fund, the time of the global financial crisis, I think a coincidence, sometime around then, relative poverty in the developing world overtook relative poverty in the rich world. We're now looking at higher relative poverty rates in developing countries than we see in rich countries. That's, that's remarkable. I mean, you, you'd never imagine, 20 years ago, you, you probably wouldn't have imagined that possible. Okay, Malaysia. What I've done here, and I, I've spent a bit of time on this, but um, I've tried to give some illustrative calculations of what would seem to me make sense in Malaysia. Now, I'm not, these are illustrative, just to see what it might look like. These would have to obviously have to be developed properly by uh, Malaysians and, and they would have to be using the micro data. We'd have to do a whole lot of work, right? But I, from what the data I can get access to and putting things together, I, I've thought about it this way. I'm going to show you absolute measures. I'm going to show you two kinds of weekly relative measures and a strongly relative measure. And here, the strongly relative measure, I'm just going to use the 50% of the mean, right? Follow, following common international practice. For the weekly relative, so the absolute, I'm going to use the official poverty line, which is um, almost exactly $4 a day. Uh, sorry, it's all in dollars, an international currency, using ICP. Um, that's an implication of using PovCalNet. I could fix that, but I, I, I didn't. Uh, and, and then a weekly relative measures. I'm going to use two. One has got an intercept of $2 a day and the other is $2.50. $2.50 is what's called the hardcore poverty rate, poverty line in Malaysia. The government in the DOS poverty statistics, you'll see a official poverty measure and you'll see what's called hardcore. The official poverty measure at 2011 ICP is $4 a day. The hardcore is $2.50 a day. They're backing it, I'm just backing that out from the um, ringgit exchange rate using the uh, private consumption PPP for Malaysia. Um, and I'm approximating a little bit, you know, rounding off a bit, just, uh, you know, don't want to make, get too fussy about the numbers. Uh, for the slope, I've used um, two, one-sixth and one-third. One-sixth for the slope gives you an elasticity of, overall elasticity of exactly 0.5, which I think is a reasonable number. Remember, for the strongly relative poverty line, the elasticity is one. That's not a believable number. As I said, the true number is between 0 and 1. Yeah? The welfare consistent number is somewhere between 0 and 1. So the first relative poverty measure, I'm going to set it at 0.5. All of that also means, with that construction, it means that I can normalize the poverty measures to be identical in 1984, the base year for PovCalNet. And so you'll see a picture that is easy to understand. The weekly relative measure, I'm anchoring it intercept to the hardcore line, one third. The reason I'm using that is it gets me to about $12 a day, which is the poverty line I would expect to see in Malaysia, given Malaysia's current average income. Internationally, if I look at the countries, if I look at the 15 countries with, that I have data on, which have an average income close to Malaysia's, um, I, Malaysia's mean is around $28 per day, 2015 prices. If I look at the countries between 24 and, and 30, 32, or actually 23 and 33, I think it was, I get a number around $12 a day. That was, the, so international experience would suggest a country at the average income of Malaysia, I would expect to see something around $12 a day. So I've anchored the sec second weekly relative line to give me that number in 2015 and that implies an overall elasticity of 0.62, which is pretty close to the overall elasticity in the developing world. 
So this is all looking, re weekly relative measure two is, I would say, very consistent with international experience. Weekly, measure, we, weekly, relative measure one, weekly relative poverty measure one is not consistent, but is, uh, I think, useful to see. Visually, uh, you'll see it in a moment. This is the one that I think something like this is what I would expect to see. Okay, here's the, uh, the point I made about weekly me me measure one. I can normalize them to be the same in 1984 with those, with those parameter values. And this is the progress we see. So, good news here. My weekly relative measures do suggest that Malaysia has made progress against poverty. It's not true that the use of this low absolute line over time has been hugely deceptive. In terms of overall progress, we're still seeing progress. And the basic parameters are pretty similar. You know, we're seeing a decline, not, not, not sharply in the new economic policy period, more sharply after the new economic policy period. Um, a hit that came in the global financial crisis, substantial rise, but returning to the overall trend downwards in the new millennium. So the weekly relative measure that I would suggest is more appropriate for Malaysia is pretty consistent over time with the absolute measure, but it's showing substantially more poverty today. It's showing a, five po a poverty rate of around 5% today, rather than virtually zero. What does my preferred weekly relative measure look like? Well, it's going to be much higher, obviously. We're talking about a decline from about 40% to uh, um, about 24%, I think, by the end of the period. Um, similar time profile, and of course we're still seeing a decline. We're still seeing a, a, a rise during the global financial crisis. Let's see if this thing's woken up yet. Oh. Okay, and here's the strongly relative measure. Now, you know what I think of the strongly relative measures, okay? Rubbish. Really. I know all of Europe, OECD except Mexico and the United States use them, but ah. And look at the silly things about it. Well here, look what happened in the global financial crisis. If you use a strongly relative measure, you'd say poverty fell during the global financial crisis. Ah, give me a break. Um, okay, that's what it looks like. Um, How are we going to time? I'm going to have to. Uh, this is more about the macroeconomics of, of poverty. Um, how does all this play with our concerns about growth and redistribution? And how the role of growth and redistribution? Uh, I'll go very quickly about this, but through this. But the central point is that in the developing world as a whole, growth has been the main driver of absolute poverty reduction. Economic growth accounts for virtually all. In Malaysia, not true. And one of the, my interests in Malaysia is that fact. Malaysia, about half of the absolute poverty reduction is attributable to falling inequality. And Malaysia is one of the few developing countries that has been successful in avoiding over a long period of time, rising inequality. This is what it looks like. It's not a dramatic decline. And as I've said, there are data issues here. Uh, this is something to explore and I'll talk about in the public lecture. But some of this could be a bit deceptive because of rising selective participation in household surveys particularly non-response rates. But something we don't have good data on, but if we had the data, we could correct for the problem. But this decline in, in overall inequality, here I've given you the Gini index, I've given you the national index the, for the uh, Burma Putra, the Chinese and the and Indians. Um, one of the implications of that is that Malaysia has one of the highest elasticities of poverty reduction to growth that I've seen. In the developing world as a whole, the elasticity is two, meaning that on average, if you have a 5% rate of growth, you have a 10% rate of poverty reduction. 
In Malaysia, the elasticity is, for the headcount index is 3.6, almost double. The reason it has this high elasticity is the success in managing inequality, in a nutshell. Um, when you turn to relative poverty measures, the role of inequality rises, obviously. Not dramatically. It's about 50% for the absolute measures, 60% for the weekly relative one, and about the same for 51% for, for my, strongly, my, my weekly relative measure too. Um, one thing I mentioned, I'm gonna t before I talk about the floor, and I, I can be fairly quick on that, um, how can we anchor these things better? Now, I, I've made some pretty heroic assumptions here, and, and I'm sticking my neck out on the parameter values for Malaysia, and you, you've seen the numbers, and you know, but I'm just putting this on the table, something to discuss. How could we go advance the discussion more? Well, one way, the best way in my view, to figure out what the poverty line should be in a country is ask people in the country. Economists don't like doing that. <laughs> Uh, there's this irony about econo economists. They love consumer sovereignty as a concept, but they hate asking people themselves whether they're better off. Uh, that's changing, changing, changed quite a lot in the last 10 years. But So one way, ask the Malaysian people what they think poverty is. Now, you can't just do that ex as simply as I just said. You can't just go and walk up to somebody, what's poverty? Right? You've got to build up, build it up. Right? But there is a way of doing it that I think is very credible. It's called, the, what I call it, the social subjective poverty line. It started with some work of um, a Dutch economist, Bernard van Praag, in the 1960s. and um, it's, His students have developed it further and, and I, I've worked on it uh, quite a bit. But I've worked on adapting it to developing countries. But the original version was this. What income do you consider to be absolutely minimal in that you could not make ends meet with any less. So Van Praag is, 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 is a very smart economist. He knows that you, know, you can't just ask people, are you poor? Well, who knows what they're going to say? Yeah? He asked them this question. And he also asked them what their actual income is. Now, you, know, you never ask somebody what their actual income is. You build up a questionnaire, lots of detail on the components of income. And he looked at subjective minimum income, the answer to that question, and how it varied with actual income. And he found this striking thing. The relationship has a positive intercept, but it's a slope roughly less than one, and a, a unique point, Z star. People in a survey, so he's asked this in the survey, lots of people, the original, this has now been done for many, many countries, and every time it's been done, it looks like this. There's a unique point above which people tend to say they're not poor and below which they tend to say they're poor. If I ask you what is the income you need to make ends meet and I compare it to your actual income, if your actual income is above that point, then implicitly you're saying uh, you're not poor. Your, your income is adequate for your needs. With that, that is the concept of poverty, adequacy for your needs. If you give an answer where your actual income is below the, the answer to the minimum income question, then implicitly you're saying you are poor. Every time this has been done, there's this unique fixed point, Z star. And Z star is what I'm going to call the social subjective poverty line. The point above which people tend to think they're not poor and below which people tend to think they're poor. If I was going to calibrate that weekly relative lines to Malaysia more consistently with how Malaysians think about poverty today, this is what I'd do. I'd figure out what Z star is. This is what I'm doing now in Indonesia. I'll be there next week on the continuing the calculations. And we're going to figure out what Z star is for Indonesia, and we're going to recalibrate the poverty lines accordingly. Well, that's the, the aim. I'd like to know what that is for Malaysia. But there's a problem. This question, I, you know, I've done a lot of survey work. I find I'm a bit uncomfortable with this, I'm a lot uncomfortable with this question. 
particularly in rural areas of developing countries, I go into a, a village and I ask people this question. And, and you know, wh what is income? Do you mean just cash income? Do you mean income with the imputed values for our consumption of our own production? What is it? I, I worry about that question. So I, I've developed a version of this which works much better in developing countries, and it's the consumption adequacy question. We ask people in the consumption module, concerning your family's own food consumption over the past month, which of the following is true? Less than adequate, less adequate, sorry, less than adequate, just adequate, more than adequate. And we ask it about clothing, housing, transport, health care, and so on. So here I can put it all together, I can find out what the income or consumption level is in which you, you, you tend to say you're just adequate for any number of these categories. I can do it just for food, I can do it for food, clothing, housing, say. Typically we do it for just food, clothing and housing, but you can add other things as well. So we can work out what the social subjective poverty line is by this other method that, that I think is, and the response rates we get on these questions is, is fantastic. I mean, you know, 99%. You know, everybody can answer this question. It's easier to answer than, what is your income? Um, we've done this initially, we did this in Jamaica and Nepal. This is the paper that documents it. Um, interestingly, in the countries where we've done it so far, one of the striking things is that the social subjective poverty rate is not very different, typically, to the, uh, the current absolute poverty rate in the country. Now, you know, in Malaysia, I would expect it to be quite different. I think it would be quite a lot higher. That's my guess. I'm not certain, but let's see. But what's really different is the profile of poverty. And one of the striking things in the profile of poverty is about the demographics of poverty. And this relates um, to Dominique's lecture a couple of days ago. Uh, when people, you ask people about poverty, one of the crucial things is your family size. And when you use absolute poverty measures, invariably you find that larger households are poorer. It kind of comes with the terrain. If you divide by the number of people, you can see, you know, larger n, smaller y over n. Yeah? When we do subjective poverty measures using the social subjective poverty line, we don't find that. We find no relationship. Larger households and do not feel poorer, essentially. Whereas in absolute measures, they do tend to be poorer. That's the main difference that we found. Okay. Um, last monitoring progress in assuring no one is left behind. Um, here, This, if you, if you look at the rhetoric, you look at the things that people say about poverty today, and I've just listed a few things here. Well, one of the striking things is there's a kind of disconnect with the, way, the, th the claims they make and a lot of what I've talked about so far today. Uh, here's a quote from UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, uh, ex-UN Secretary General. Uh, the poorest of the world are being left behind. We need to reach out and lift them into our lifeboat from Guy Ryder, the head of the ILO, the world's poorest are not being reached. Oh, that was IFPRI, sorry. Uh, Guy Ryder, poverty is not yet defeated, far too many people are left behind. And as I said, if you look at the Sustainable Development Goals, you'll see this expression, leave no one behind. Yet when we, when we read what economists say, people like me say, <laughs> A rising tide lifts all boats. I, I never said that, but uh, John F. Kennedy said that. But uh, growth is good for the poor, or, uh, uh, David Dolan, Art Cray, or, or breakthrough from the bottom, Steve Radlett. Uh, they seem to be telling a very different story. There's a puzzle here. When I first saw um, Ban Ki Moon's comment, I thought, well, my goodness, hasn't he read our papers? Hasn't he read my paper in particular? Doesn't he know that poverty is falling dramatically? How can he say? <laughs> The poor, the poor are being left behind. Ah. Doesn't the UN staff, they don't t tell their Secretary General what the research is showing. But I thought about it, maybe there's something wrong in the research. And here's the, the essence of the problem. Here are 
two sets of two distribution functions. So a distribution function just gives you the community percent of the population below each point on the x-axis. Right? That's what we call a community distribution function. Yeah? On the left here, we've got two distributions. Suppose that's the two dates, say Malaysia in 1970 and Malaysia now. Yeah? If we see, in, in both those two dates, we're seeing a dramatic, when we compare those two dates, we see a dramatic fall in, in the poverty measure. On the right, we see the same thing. The way this poverty line is drawn, the reduction in the poverty measure is about the same. But there's a big difference. On the left, the lowest level of living has not risen. On the right, it has. So maybe the Ban Ki Moon could be right. It's just that our poverty measures are not picking up what's happening at the very bottom. Now we can use a distribution sensitive poverty measures, squared poverty gap, Watts index, but they still don't reflect well what's happening at the bottom. They don't explicitly tell us whether the floor is rising. And in fact, they can fall with the floor when the floor is actually falling as well. And I've, I've shown you, I found examples of that. So what we need is actually to focus on the very bottom. Not instead of our normal poverty measure, as a complement to our normal poverty measure, to see whether it is the case that we are leaving no one behind. Because the only way we're going to eliminate poverty is that the poorest person rises to the poverty line. It's not going to happen if the poorest person doesn't see any progress. Obviously then, we will not eliminate poverty. So what's happening in the world? What's happening first in the world as a whole? Um, here I've plotted the absolute change in, in income over a 30 year period in the developing world yeah, against percentile, so poorest on the left, richest on the right. What you see here is virtually no gain at the bottom. In other words, those two pairs of distylized distributions I showed you before, this is what it looks like. We're seeing gains to poor people. This is positive. But we're not, the gains are virtually zero at the bottom. Huge at the top. This is just for the developing world. Here's a stunner. This is the world as a whole. And, you know, we don't know. Believe me, this could go phew, if we measured it well. We don't. We do not measure the incomes of the rich very well. Here's another picture. Here I've given you the overall mean for the developing world. And here I've given you my estimate of the floor, the lower bound of the distribution in the world as a whole. It's about $1 a day, and it stayed about $1 a day over this 30-year period. Since 2000, we've seen the overall growth rate in the developing world rise. Look at it. You know? And that's fantastic. That's great news, obviously. We've gone from a, long, a trend growth rate of 2% per person per annum to a trend growth rate of 4% per person per annum in the developing world. That's the convergence of seeing. That's what's happening. This is the, the dramatic thing that's happening in the world today. But that rise hasn't lifted the floor. That's very alarming in my view. Now, a little aside on statistics. One of the remarkable things, that orange line has a statistically significant positive slope. That just uh, tells you how deceptive statistics can be. <laughs> what? Positive slope? Where is it? Well, it is there that it's really small. <laughs> but it is statistically significant, if that means anything to you. To me, that means statistical significance is a dubious concept. 
Well, I've made the calculations for Malaysia. Here I give you overall mean, crisis, return to trajectory, We're now up to about $28 a day at 2011 base. What happened to the floor? Well, it has actually risen. $2.30 to $3 is my estimate. It's risen more than for the developing world as a whole, but it hasn't risen a lot. So the poorest people in Malaysia are in essentially pretty much being left behind. Not entirely, but you know, pretty close. No way they're keeping up. Now, the talk about eradicating poverty in Malaysia, <laughs> you'll never do it unless you get the floor up to the poverty line. The four dollars a day line, the official measure, you've got another dollar <laughs> to go. And at this rate, it's going to take another 200 years. So, <laughs> yeah, you're not there yet. You've got a way to go even if you just work with the official measures. This is an aspect of something I'm going to talk about in the public lecture, the rising absolute inequality in the world. Overall relative inequality in the world is actually falling because of the rise of China and India. Low income, previously low income countries rising in the distribution. And Malaysia too, but Malaysia with only 30 million people can't compete with China and India and the weight of China and India in those numbers is huge. But absolute inequality is rising. Absolute inequality is about the absolute gaps between the rich and the poor. Whereas relative inequality is about the, the ratios. And here I've just given you for the um, Malaysia this is that relative Gini index that I showed you already before, the falling relative inequality. What's happening to absolute inequality? Well, absolute inequality in Malaysia, here and anywhere, is a measure of the average gap between the incomes of people. The absolute gap, not normalised by the mean. Whereas when we measure relative inequality, we normalise by the mean. It's all relative. Relative inequality is about the ratios of incomes, one person to another. Absolute inequality is about the differences. And when we talk about the gap between the rich and the poor, we're talking about absolute inequality. That concept is absolute. I believe about half, I, I've done many, sur I've surveyed 450 students at Georgetown, we've done surveys, uh, academic friends have done surveys elsewhere. We're pretty sure that, at least among students, who are the only people we've had access to for asking this question, we're pretty sure that about half the students think about inequality as absolute and half think about it as inequality as relative. And I could figure this out. I could do a survey in this room. I could tell which of you think about inequality as absolute and which of you think about it as relative. It's not like there's a problem if you're absolutist. I'm a relativist, but I accept they're absolutist. Dominique is an absolutist and you know, we get along fine. It's not a problem. Yeah? There are absolutists and they're relativists. There are people who think about inequality as the absolute difference in income and there are people who think about inequality as a relative difference in income. It's just a fact. Yeah? But if we have a dialogue about inequality and we ignore one side or the other, it's not going to be very useful. And it is, makes a big difference. If you think about the people who are saying inequality, don't believe the, the official statistics on inequality in Malaysia, and they say it's far higher, and I don't think it's falling, it's rising, they may well just be absolutists. Nothing wrong. But we have to understand whether what you're talking about. We have to understand, are you a relativist or absolutist, to make sense of the dialogue. OK, winding up. I've argued that social effects on welfare, the evidence is now compelling from research that people care about, think about their relative position. Lots of evidence. They don't just care about their relative position, they also care about their absolute level of living. So we need new poverty measures. The, neither the absolute measures nor the relative measures are correct. 
I've also argued, and we can construct those measures. We can calibrate them to what makes sense internationally, or we can hopefully calibrate it also to what people think in the country. And we can, by that means, make poverty measures socially relevant. We can also monitor progress in leaving no one behind, and I've pointed at Ms. Shown you that I haven't gone to the technical details of how we measure the consumption floor. It's actually quite tricky. But um, to make, um, there's no doubt in my mind that Malaysia has made huge progress against absolute poverty. There's no doubt, right? But there's a lot of other things less reassuring. The lack of progress in reaching the poorest. The fact that the official line is, is clearly too low today. I don't believe it reflects what people consider poverty in, in Malaysia today. But you know, that's a researchable question. That's my hypothesis. And we can, in a way, we, you know, implementing ideas from Ungu Aziz back in the 1960s, we can, we can implement these things now in a much more sophisticated way with much better data and much better models and methods, and we can do it. The illustrative calculations I've uh, given you suggest that Malaysia has been making progress against relative poverty, provided you measure it in a sensible way, not this strongly relative measures, which I think just don't, don't make sense to me. Uh, I've also argued that inequality management has played an important role. Inequality management isn't about eliminating inequality. Inequality management is about avoiding rising inequality. Lastly, and this is the last slide, second last, um, I, I really think we, Malaysia needs to make much more progress on public access to the micro data, the national data used for measuring poverty. This is, this is, not, this is way behind international standards. We have lots of tools for doing that now, but the point is that you know, doing poverty and inequality research and policy research related to inequality and poverty and also to economic growth, doing that research requires access to the microdata, the complete microdata. It's just not doable. By modern standards, Malaysia will just be a backwater in the research on poverty and inequality unless this happens. You just can't do serious research on this topic without access to the micro. The researchers have to have access to the microdata. The only suitable microdata for measuring poverty and inequality that I could get access to is the Malaysia Family Life Survey, 1976 and 1989. Give me a break. Public access should be a high priority going forward. Okay, folks. Terima kasih. Thank you very much. Um, a little bit of advertisement for my book, The Economics of Poverty, which doesn't contain most of what I talked about today, but a lot of other good stuff. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Prof. Rebellion. Um I think I will just straight away give the floor to the participants. Please introduce yourself and mention your affiliation. This is just for record keeping purposes. All right, can I open the floor for Q&A session? Uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, I like your starting point when you said that the poverty line is just the starting point. This is what many researchers on poverty in Malaysia have been saying that we all recognize that the poverty line in Malaysia is far too low, but I think one dimension of the poverty line that you did not mention is that the poverty line is highly political. We have sat in debates on poverty line and we've all told the, the authorities and the powers that be, the poverty line is set far too low. But their response has been that if we raise the poverty line, most of the Malaysian civil service will be in poverty, and that does not bode well for the, uh, the public declarations and the global declarations that Malaysia has been making as far as progress on poverty. If you suddenly say that your poverty levels have 
doubled or trebled, which is what will happen if you really have the real poverty line. So it is highly political, and no matter what we say, it is very unlikely that the poverty line will be revised to the right level. That's my first point. A second point is that your frustration about not having access to uh, public data. I've had 30 years of not having access to public data. There has been some progress as far as access to poverty uh, 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 line and the, even the measure in the poverty line, even the components of poverty line. When I first started my research on poverty, they told me the poverty line was a national secret. A national secret. They couldn't tell me anything about it. So we had to work around with whatever we had. So now they've come a long way. At least you know what is the component of the poverty line. So Malaysia has made a lot. If you look at the history of how poverty is measured in Malaysia, there's been a lot of changes, a lot of improvements. Right now, what they're talking about is the bottom 40%. And I have a lot of uh, discussions, uh, a lot of reservations about the bottom 40%. Because if you take a, house, uh, a, group, a community or a group and you say bottom 40%, they treat the bottom 40% as if it's a homogeneous group. It's not. That's the bottom, that's the middle, that's the absolute bottom 40%. And all their characteristics and the manifestation, the causes of poverty are all totally different. As far as access, so those of us who actually work with organizations that want to go and implement programs on the ground to try to identify who are the real poor, we go through various exercises. We use, as you said, that the poverty line as a starting point. That we have to do no choice, but if we had used that as a starting point, we know it's not accurate. Then we go to the field, and then we get the different measures of poverty from all the field authorities, like the district office, etc. And then, of course, your idea of asking the poor what, or, or people, what about poverty? So we do also, when we are at the village level, we do ask the villagers, who do you think are the poor households in this area? Then, of course, we have got this famous database called Ikase. Okay, there was a state of Tranganu which was updating its Ikase on a daily basis. I mean, that was a bit ridiculous. Okay, on a daily basis, the, the, the poor are increasing in the Ikase base. The problem with the Ikase, I mean, it was a good starting point. They spent millions of dollars, millions, in fact, even billions. Uh, this was under the uh, ICU to develop this database on the poor. The problem is, not everybody who deserves to be in the Ikase are in the Ikase. I have been on the field and seen people actually being recruited and drafted and registered in the Ikase while we are on the field. They should have been there a long time ago and be registered. But at least there is a database. So what we do when we go to the ground to find the real poor so that we can give them, uh, mm -hmm. we can extend our development inputs to them, what we do is we take the poverty line, we take the district officer's poverty line, we take the village head's poverty line, and then we take the Ikase, and then we do a matrix. And then anybody who appears on all these uh, different uh, measures of poverty, we consider them the real poor, and then we target them for poverty approaches. As, as you said rightly in your, in, your, in, your, in your presentation somewhere, that the poverty line in 1970 was very suitable. Of course, it's not suitable nowadays. So now, the, the level of poverty that Malaysia is dealing with, the, the amounts the numbers are actually very small. But what it requires is a very micro level approach. The macro level approaches are not going to work. There are pockets of poverty. When we sit here in Kuala Lumpur, we don't understand what's happening in Sarawak, where, where Fatima comes from, where people don't have access to basic necessities. So those people are not even captured. They don't have water, they don't have electricity. They have to go miles to get access to anything like health or education. So th these are the realities on the ground. So Malaysia has to move forward a lot in terms of what uh, it wants to do to look better, improve, and, and actually really tackle the, the, the poverty pr pr problem. But of course, the other dimension that, again, is sometimes missed is that the, the, the new forms of poverty that are emerging, the new, the, the new entrance into poverty, and then we always talk of poverty and poverty line, but we don't talk about the vulnerable, the, the groups that could be above the poverty line marginally, but are still equally vulnerable. And, and the manifestations, again, are different. So I think I don't want to get carried away because I get so excited when I talk about this topic. Let me just end there. Thank you. Oh, yeah. um, I don't disagree with anything, anything you said. Um, one thing I'd say, though, don't give up on, of course, poverty measures are political. Uh, I've known that for 40 years and I've been in that debate for 40 years. And in many countries where I, I've worked with others to raise the poverty line, and the resistance has been huge. Uh, 
and Malaysia is not any di more difficult than, say, China. In China, we, we, we doubled the poverty line. We had to raise that to the highest level. We did it with the statistics office. It went to the very top before it was approved. And we had all the debates you can talk about. You can do it. India, we've done it. Um, not as much as I would have hoped in Vietnam. Um, it's, a, it's a debate. But the fact that poverty measures are political works in your favour too. Because as the poverty measure becomes so out of whack, inconsistent with popular perceptions of poverty, people, it loses credibility. And that becomes a politically costly fact. It's politically dangerous going forward for a government to be promoting poverty measures which are inconsistent with the social subjective poverty line. In other words, what I'm saying is the social subjective poverty line is the, the consensus line above which people tend to think they're not poor and below which people tend to think they're poor. If you have a poverty line which is too far from the social subjective poverty line, people will not take it seriously. And I see this in the media. I see uh, ministers in this government saying this too. People are aware of this. That fact will start to be politically costly to the government. They will have to find a way. There are also ways of managing it. You, don't have, you can use a new word, a low income threshold or something. You, know, you can have a transition period where you use the old line and the new line. You can manage this process, but my central point is the politics will at some point turn. It might have already happened in Malaysia. And you just need, as analysts and economists and statisticians, we just need to be there at the right time to show, to move the debate forward. And your last, your, most of your last part, I think, is really about corroborating what I said about Malaysia is not reaching the poorest. And I can show you that now, and we can see that in numbers. Uh, the, measurement, the measures make assumptions, and we could improve the data if I had access to the microdata, etc. But even from what we know, I think we can credibly say now that that is, not, that is the case. Everything you said is consistent with what I see in the data. Thank you very much, Martin. It's great to see good to see you here in Malaysia and, and, and for your talk. Um, and for raising some of the key issues that, I mean, I've been working on my two and a half years here and many others like for, for decades, like Prof. Sulo, as far as data access, poverty line too low. Um, one of the areas I found really interesting to talk was, I mean, I've got many points, but one is on this socially subjective poverty line. And you, you talked about your concerns about for very low income settings or for poor settings and how that might be captured. And I'm thinking about higher income settings as well, where the question, you know, what do you need to make ends meet and how that can be influenced or contaminated perhaps by the social norms aspect that you talked about earlier that somebody who has their kids in private school has car payments has the big motor yeah. make ends meet has a different meaning than it might and so what what are your thoughts on how to protect against that or, or to get good measures on that end uh, in richer country settings thanks yeah. um, actually one of the attractions i find of the social subjective poverty line concept is that it automatically builds in access to um, income and kind, public services and so on. Because if, you're, if you have good public services, you have universal health care provision, for example, or you have good uh, access to high quality, affordable education, uh, you won't answer uh, as high an income being needed to meet your, your needs. So it I actually, it is a money metric of welfare because it, it automatically would reflect. Your answer to that question will reflect those things. So in, f in a sense, that's, that's why I always emphasize, people say, oh, you can't just measure poverty with money. Uh, nonsense, of course you can, as long as you make your monetary measures money metrics of welfare. They have to reflect those other things, and that's the problem. And the problem in conventional poverty measurement is that that hasn't been the case. So um, I actually, I think that, uh, that, that uh, reinforces the case across both low-income and high-income countries. Uh, the other point I'd make there is that uh, um, we are re we've converged on one world here. You know, what I've laid out here is a way of thinking about poverty which is universal. We don't have to think of it as absolute poverty lines in poor countries, and the United States, by the way, <laughs> poor countries 
and relative lines, strongly relative lines in rich countries, these two worlds with these two completely non-comparable methodologies. We can unify it. So those graphs I showed you were the world with one, one method of measuring poverty across poor countries and rich countries. That's, done, that can be in your, that's true in objective measurement and it's true in subjective measurement as well. Okay, uh, oh, the, the, uh, one, one qualification there. Um, social subjective welfare measurement, poverty measurement is very good in one country. We have very little experience and some concerns about making inter-country comparisons using social subjective poverty line concepts. There I think we're going to fall back to objective. Maybe with some anchoring to the subjective, but we're going to have a, some, some serious problems there going ahead. But we're, we're a long way from that too now because we don't have social subjective poverty lines for most countries. Hi, I'm Ezian from um, the Employees Provident Fund Malaysia. Um, you touched upon the social inclusion cost for the poorest. I was wondering whether there are any like inter-country comparison statistics to show this social inclusion cost because I think it's quite interesting if you can actually reduce this cost. I mean, at the end of the day, the, the, the result will be a reduction in poverty rates. I, 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 would, I would think so. So is there any inter-country inter, you know, statistics on this? And how do you actually measure it? that all of the national poverty lines that I showed you already include social inclusion costs. When people measure poverty in a country, they are, I would argue, already including those costs. So when I showed you that picture of the national poverty lines rising, I said that one reason we see that is that higher costs of social inclusion in richer countries. So there's a vast amount of data on it. It is the data I showed you. In other words, the national poverty line in a country we can think of as a kind of basic survival needs plus costs of social inclusion in that country. Things like dressing appropriately, being able to eat the kind of food that's accepted in that country, the degree of social interactions accepted in that country, being able to go to the cinema with your friends sometimes and so on. Those things vary. And in rich countries, having a car, for example. This is part of social inclusion. Now I'd argue having a, a, a cell phone is a social inclusion need in India. Certainly in China, for example. Much poorer country than Malaysia, obviously. So there, the data's there, yes, it is. Um, it's there. <laughs> so uh, now unpacking it, so you can have an actual number, which is the social inclusion need, and this is the, the uh, survival need. That unpacking is difficult, right? For a conceptual reason, that a lot of goods serve both needs. You know, food is a, both a primary need for survival, and it's a social inclusion need, because food and the diets of people are a socially determined thing. Yeah? So unpacking can be difficult, but it is there. Second thing, Nobody should be thinking of this as an objective being to reduce the cost of social inclusion. Uh, th this is not, I'm not saying that. Um, there are costs of social inclusion. They need to be, you need to have incomes to cover those costs. I'm not sure that I would think about it as an objective of reducing the costs of social inclusion. There may be some cases where we could make that more efficient or less you know, we could possibly reduce those costs to the benefit of people. You know, um, obviously, if you can reduce the cost of fresh cat in Sanaa, which you probably can't get now, you would be reducing the cost of social inclusion. But I, I don't see it as a primary part of the objective. I mean, generally reducing the cost facing poor people generates welfare benefits, but I'm not arguing that that's a primary important part of policy here. I'm not sure whether um, you know, this question has already been asked by, by Ken, or, yeah, but it's related to that. You, you talked about uh, doing some work um, uh, in Indonesia on social uh, subjective um, poverty measurement. Yeah? 
Um, I, I was just curious that, um, yeah, there are measurements even in the, um, uh, what do you call that, ho the household income, household income surveys or, or, or that type of surveys, the questions that you ask is very basic, right? Um, but every society would have the extra cultural norm or uh, that w you probably would classify that as social interaction, like social participation, mm -hmm. you know? Um, would you include that, or where do you stop when you talk about a subjective, subjective um, uh, poverty measurement? Okay. The um, I'm not. There, there's no. There's no. It's not like a long list of things that we keep adding to. It's determined by the the way people answer those questions. So, for example, in Indonesia, we have implemented. Um, I was on the the board of the IFLS, so I had. <laughs> I could get into the IFLS, the Indonesia Family Life Survey, exactly the questions I wanted, which we're now analysing to work out what the social subjective poverty line is in Indonesia. Uh, but we don't make a list of social inclusion needs, we just base it on what people say. Right? So my view is that the best source of information about the cost of social inclusion is to ask people these questions. What is the income you consider adequate to meet your needs for particular items of consumption. Um, you know, and and it's, it seems to me almost inevitable that as countries develop, overall living standards rise, that the answer will change, right? Your, your concept of what it is necessary to make ends meet, to live at a socially acceptable level in, in that country, will evolve as it has in every country. As I said, in the United States, it's gone from the beginning of the 20th century to the end of the 20th century, it's gone from $1 to $16. Yeah? Every country, that'll happen. It's a natural process. Uh, for measurement, we, we don't have to make long lists. We, don't have to, we, we just have to look at uh, these questions. Um, now, there is a long list approach, <laughs> which is um, creating a bundle of goods, and th this is a credible approach to measuring poverty, and one that I, I uh, if, you can't, if you can't do the social subjective poverty line, I'd probably use this method, where we do make a list, but we, the components of the list have to be informed by understanding the particular society, what's a, what is considered appropriate in that particular time. Um, often they do this through expert groups, you set up a bunch of people who know the country and, and they make this list, and, and you, then you price that list, and you do your poverty line that way. You know, it becomes a less bare price index, but with an anchoring bundle of goods that can vary. Yeah? Does that help? Uh, okay. Other questions? Hello, uh, my name is Hawati from Karzana Research Institute. I just want to follow on from uh, Prof. Solo uh, a point just now on B40. I just want to get uh, some opinion from you in terms of the shift from of the government, uh, the focus policy focus from poverty to B40. What is your take on that? Whether that is a po poverty to, I'm not to B40, uh, bottom 40, B oh, bottom 40. 40. <laughs> so whether that is a good start to incorporate uh, the relativity perspective in terms of uh, policy program program that uh, government yeah. take on. Uh, but whether this will uh, contribute for us to lose sight in terms of tackling poverty. And secondly, how, how do you think this uh, social, uh, social sub subjective measure on poverty can be extended in terms of us to look I in terms of not poverty, but decent uh, living standard, for example, uh, for in the concept of living wage and so on, whether um, consumption is the metric that we should look at, or whether we, we should include other dimension into it, into coming, in, yeah. Okay. Um. You know, one of the, maybe a starting point for thinking about poverty in my view is that it is something that can be eliminated. Poverty can be eliminated. Poverty can go to zero, whether you think of it as absolute or relative. If you think of poverty in terms of welfare, it's in, it must be, conceptually, it must be the case that it can be zero. 
So if you measure poverty by the poorest 40 percent, it will never be zero. There will always be a poorest 40 percent. So this is not a good way to measure poverty. It violates this basic principle that I think any poverty measure should have. Um, it doesn't make sense to say that the poorest 40 percent are always poor. The poorest 40 percent in, in Luxembourg are, are very well-off people. So that, uh, that approach, it's not that I, I, I think it should be abandoned. It may be useful for focusing attention in some cases. Um, I was involved at the when I worked at the World Bank in developing a shared prosperity measure, and we fo focused on the poorest 40 percent for that, looking at how the mean of the poorest 40 percent varies with the overall mean. I, I was never very comfortable with it, but <laughs> you know, somebody they wanted that. Um, but I, I don't think that's the way we should think about poverty at all. Okay. Um, and on your second point. Um, I'm emphasizing that we can measure poverty in terms of incomes all the time, and it's not a problem. It's how we calibrate the measure of income. If we just use like cash income, that's nonsense. Obviously, we've got to include imputed values for consumption from our own production, hugely important for farm households, but there are many other things we may have to inc include. It's about how we calibrate our income-based welfare measure. And as I've argued, it should always be a money metric of some agreed concept of welfare, something we can say is sensible for saying that one person is better off than another. We can always measure that, turn that into a money metric. It's actually much easier for people to understand than talking about utils or something. Who knows what, what are they? Yeah? So the point isn't, the problem isn't using money as the metric. The problem is how we calibrate the monetary measure. Hi, uh, my name is Christopher from Kazana Research Institute as well. Uh, my question is more policy oriented. Um, I think you're making the case that we need to improve our poverty measurement in Malaysia, uh, which I agree. Uh, but because of the complexity of uh, the, the data issues in Malaysia, and I think, I think Prof. Sulo has also highlighted the issue with our poverty targeting database, IKASE, uh, with a lot of exclusion and inclusion errors and all that. Uh, so there's some thinking that we should move away from income-based targeting to a more universal approach to reaching out to the poor. So what are your thoughts on this uh, universal versus targeting debate? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have long argued, as has Dominique, who works in this area too, um, I've, we've long argued that there's a, a kind of what I call targeting fetishism in a lot of the dialogue in development today, and it has been for 20 years or so. Um, you know, think about it this way. Um, I was giving a, a public lecture in, in Stockholm two years ago, and I, I was asking people in Sweden, um, what, how did Sweden start attacking poverty when Sweden was as poor as countries in Africa today? Right? Back in the um, early part of the 19th century, how do, and, and through the 19th century. Did they use targeting? The answer was no, because they couldn't do it. They didn't have the administrative capability for fine targeting. Developing countries today, most countries don't have that capability. It's quite difficult to do credibly. The inclusion, exclusion errors problem, the targeting errors, the costs that you often impose on poor people to comply with the conditions that you generate to achieve better targeting can be hi very high. And if you properly account for all those costs, you may be having very little impact on poverty. All you're doing is finally targeting a very small gain to poor people. That's not good. That's not the best way to fight poverty. So I w we've argued in the past that you need to relax about targeting. It's not the objective. Poverty reduction is the objective. It doesn't mean that targeting is useless. Sometimes it can help, sometimes it can't help. You need to adapt your policy to the circumstances, the administrative capabilities of the country, the data available, and so on. You also need to improve the administrative capabilities as part of your development dialogue, obviously. 
but don't think of targeting as the objective. So as a general proposition, I would argue that we're more relaxed about targeting, more universal programs. Um, the other point about targeting is that it's not just issues of data, it's also issues of social solidarity. Targeting can be very divisive. And I've seen this a number of times, where you target better and better. I did this in Argentina. I developed this great program with many others, a great team of people. We developed this program that was so well targeted, <laughs> it became under threat <laughs> politically because it was not helping the middle class. And we ha were into a defense mode. And I realized, in a sense, we were, going, we were too good at this. We were technocrats. We were targeting really well and making it getting to the poorest, but in the process, the poorest would, could easily end up with a very finely targeted small program because the program was being cut from above because it wasn't reaching the key middle income voters. Yeah? But that's a, a, a political economy aspect of a general point about the importance of social solidarity here. A lot of our fine targeting, we may overestimate how well we can do that, but we may also generate, undermine the political and social foundation for effort against poverty, which would be very worrying. There are other issues here too, but this is really um, a part of my public lecture and I'll come back to it then. Touch that, but I think there are certain countries, I think like Indonesia for instance, yeah. would, would also use expenditure measures as, because like in the context of Malaysia, in the urban areas, when you t look at income per se, and the, and the official poverty line, you find that the, the rates are ridiculously low. But when you go into households, you find very high levels of household debts and household expenditure. So either the income has been uh, not declared properly, or you know, so whether an uh, expenditure approach would be a better proxy mm -hmm. for income. Thank you. Um, this is a long debate. Um, I mentioned Tony Atkinson, my late Tony Atkinson, my PhD supervisor, we used to debate this. He was always thought income was better than consumption. And I said consumption is better than income. We never agreed on this. I'm very much of the view that consumption, the way we measure it in developing countries, is a better measure of welfare than income, the way we measure it. Yeah? But, you know, as I said, really intelligent people can disagree on this. Uh, it's not a... It's not an issue where I, which I, I think we sh you know, everything rests or fails on it. If a country is happy with its income measures, fine. Um, but my, my view as an economist is, is really that consumption, your current consumption is really the closer concept to your well-being now than your current income. Yeah? Uh, and partly, a part of that is coming from, you know, Tony's talking about working on poverty in Britain and I'm talking about working poverty in very poor countries. In poor countries, you know, the idea of measuring poverty with income is, is really hard to believe. Now Malaysia is between the two. Malaysia is an upper income, upper middle income country and, and maybe income is a more appropriate measure. But as you move from very poor country to rich country, the, the nature of the arguments does change. Yeah. Um, but the point is this, that you know, when, when households face income variability, to some extent it's predictable. A farmer knows that he's going to face good and bad years and will save accordingly. Credit markets may not work well, but the people can self-insure, protect themselves that way. So I would, would be reticent about you. And of course, the famous example of, of income-based welfare measurement is, is, is Donald Trump. Donald Trump had a minor, had a ninety million dollar negative income, which he ninety million negative income uh, some years back, which he spread over many years to avoid his income tax. Which the reason he won't release his income tax records is that he, he didn't pay any income tax for years and years because he wrote off all this ninety million dollar loss on his casinos, spread it over many years, and you can't tell me Donald Trump was poor. Minus 90 million? No, he wasn't poor. Hi, my name is Farhana. I'm from the government. Um, I didn't want to ask about wealth uh, because I didn't think they would, um, I, I didn't know whether it was relevant. But then, since you brought up that point, um, I was wondering what you thought of 
measuring wealth because wealth is more you know visible and um, of course the income from wealth is imputed in the typical uh, HIM household income surveys but uh, a, an easy way to do it is to gross up from because the way Malaysia is built is that even the poorest or the the relatively low-income ones have access to savings plans for example the pension fund the big um, government linked investment funds which which has its inequalities Im embedded w within the account sizes, but they all have some level of dividend income or interest income from their savings, even though they come from lower income households. So I wonder what you felt about attempting to measure wealth by grossing up the imputed dividends that you get from the household income surveys, or whether that, was, that would be useful. Measuring wealth is really difficult. And, um, yeah, I, I, I've never kind of been happy with anything I've seen. But, um, and you, you can do that, grossing up dividends from surveys and so on. But so many things you've left out. Um, I, I, the concept of wealth is hugely important in economics, right? And the ideas of, in my book, I talk a lot about wealth. What's that? Yeah. but. That's right. It's very hard to measure. I, I, I fully encourage efforts to measure it, and there's some good work that's being done, and um, some heroic work. I mean, uh, Tony Shorrocks' work for Credit Suisse, for example, measuring is, 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 is Tony Shorrocks is, is a great economist, but is, there's efforts that are going on that I, I, I fully encourage. Um, but I, I don't think we'll ever replace consumption or income for poverty and inequality measurement. And I don't think it ever should. I think it's like it sits there as another angle. For example, in understanding poverty traps, in understanding the dynamics of poverty, it can be very important to have data on wealth. Micro data on wealth I've used often in trying to understand. And wealth here has to be understood very generally, I think. Uh, financial wealth, physical wealth, human capital. And we need a, a composite wealth concept that reflects them all. And it's part of our understanding of the mechanisms that generate poverty and how it is perpetuated. But in measurement, I would not go down that road. I would see it as, as an important um, right-hand side variable in models of understanding poverty, but not as the uh, dependent variable, if you like. Is there more, any more question from the floor? Okay, um, we are about 15 minutes from the time schedule. I mean, I mean, if there is such thing as poor household, there is another thing as poor mod moderator, I suppose. I did not manage to control the time that well, but I think I give everybody enough time to sort of uh, discuss about the issue when Martin is with us. Um, I think that we might, might as well wrap it up now because of the time is already at 11.20 when we are supposed to start at 11. Now, if you may just sort of give me some uh, mention on take home point here, right? Uh, Martin did mention about the data and of course the framework of analysis and poor access as far as Malaysian is experience is concerned. And the other thing is, uh, how do we take care of the social impact of uh, poverty issues? And, yet, and, and on this score, Martin mentioned the need to uh, introduce social subjective poverty line. And of course, with the social subjective poverty line, uh, there must be an effort to, to have a welfare consistent measures. Um, uh, the other thing that uh, is also mentioned from the floor is the question of uh, poverty line being a political issue. Uh, Dr. Sulo, thank you very much for that. And I think that br brought us to the discussion on we must continue to debate about it and then perceptions. And at the end of the day, it's just about reaching to the poor as far as policy framework is concerned. Now, um, before I hand it over to the Secretariat, uh, there's some housekeeping measures here. On the 16th of January, there will be another event uh, organized by the Unko Aziza Poverty Center, Development Centers. Uh, 
And on the 29th of January, Martin will also be giving uh, public lectures. And please check on our website on those two events. Everybody is a public event, so please do come around to support us. Uh, the other thing is lunch will be served. This is the best part of the day. I think you shouldn't miss it, okay? I think at the ground floor. So before I hand it over to the uh, secretary, please join me in a round of applause to thank Martin for his presentation today. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Martin and uh, Dr. Fatima. Actually, we are not uh, late. Uh, another announcement is that we have to have a photo shoot <laughs> before we break up for lunch. Uh, I'd just like to, to uh, comment uh, in general. Uh, I think uh, the discussion and the presentation and the discussion uh, are very rich, uh, especially in terms of input uh, for the center. Uh, one uh, thing that I picked up from Martin during his time in the last three weeks is about asking questions. That was the first thing he asked me, you know, what, what is the question? What are you asking <laughs> when I talk about uh, projects, for example? Yeah, so, but I think we have been asking a lot of questions, many questions over the years. Dr. Sulo started when she was 20 and now she's almost 100, still asking the same question. Many people, I think things are just moving too slowly, yeah? And uh, uh, I think the time to move is already now. Uh, we, we cannot delay any longer. And what Martin has raised and what the floor has raised in terms of, in terms of questions and comments, I think will be a, a huge uh, repertoire research agenda for the center. I will keep tapping uh, Martin's brain and of course uh, Dominique uh, so that we can have uh, a lot of footprints from their tenure and visit uh, here. Um, also, I forgot to acknowledge uh, earlier uh, the presence of uh, participation of our funders. I think Saim Dabi and Petronas, they're both here, representatives. So that uh, maybe also when we report to them, we can uh, mention, you know, in terms of direction and research uh, uh, agenda and probably can ask uh, for more money. I think uh, there's a lot, a lot of interest and uh, the, the mechanism to capture this interest. Of course, academics at the faculty, everybody shares, I think, the same problem. It doesn't be res uh, have to be research on poverty, but res any research. This whole point about access to data, access to micro data, we are so behind other countries and I think it's time to talk not just to academics, economies, uh, statisticians, uh, governments, but uh, to define an agenda what we can do in the most crucial, uh, uh, how do I say, uh, areas that uh, we have to move uh, quickly. Yeah. Okay, with that I would like to thank again all of you who have uh, attended our round table. Uh, the previous one and this one, and I think we will have more. As I said in the beginning, uh, moving forward for us is, is uh, extremely exciting with uh, Martin and, and Dominic here. So I invite your participation in all our coming activities. Thank you very much. So we now move to the photo session. <laughs>